Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Ivy Church. It's so great to see you. My name is Tim, and I'm part of the team here at Ivy. We'd love to hear from you, so why don't you say hello in the chat or in the comments if you're joining us on Facebook. If it's your first time joining us and you're just checking things out, it's great to see you. We'd love to hear from you and connect with you too. So if you are here for the first time, or maybe you've been coming online for a few weeks, then why don't you let us know by filling out our Get Connected form by clicking on the link that will pop up now in the chat or go to ivychurch.org forward slash connect. So every year, uh, we have a word of the year for us as Ivy Church and 2022 is the year of rebuilding. We're looking at the book of Nehemiah and the Old Testament and Louise is going to be speaking to us a little later on on how every single one of us has a part to play in God's kingdom. That's great news, isn't it? That God wants to use you. You have a part to play. So I'm really excited for today because wherever you are on the journey of faith, I know that God is going to speak to you. So we're going to start by worshipping our amazing God together. But first, let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can come together like this online from all over the world. Thank you for your amazing goodness and love. And I pray for everyone watching and engaging today that, Lord, that you would speak to them and speak to us all for our strengthening and encouragement. Reveal your plans and purposes that you have for each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come, let us bow at his feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven. You conquered the grave, you free every captain and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive, oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. Oh, yes, you have. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. Oh, we believe. God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Oh, we declare, sing it out. And hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. You conquer the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in 
your freedom awaken alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great things oh healer of heaven you conquered the grave you free every captive and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great things you have done great things oh god you do great gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this I hold How strange and divine I can sing all is mine yet not I but through Christ in me the night is dark but I am not forsaken for by my side the Savior he shall stay I labor on in weakness and rejoicing for in my need his power is displayed to this I hold my shepherd will defend He has said 
that he will bring me home and day by day i know he will renew me until i stand with joy before the throne to this i We're going to pray together in a moment. All throughout this year of rebuilding, we're making time to pray the Lord's Prayer together. Maybe it's a very familiar prayer to you. Maybe it's new. I once heard the Lord's Prayer described as the prayer that teaches us to pray. And that's been my experience. It's not just something to recite, but it's a guide that shows us how to pray when we don't know what to pray. So let's pray together now. And if you don't know it, the words are going to come up on the screen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now, before we hear from Louise, I'm going to give you the opportunity to give back to God. And you can do that by going to ivychurch.org forward slash giving. Let me tell you a story. Ruth is a very strong woman. She likes to play tug of war. Now Louise thinks that she is very strong too, and she works out a lot. She thinks that she can definitely take on Ruth on her own. Nope. So Louise gets a friend, Tim. Tim is quite strong, but he doesn't work out as much as Louise. Together, they have a go at taking on Ruth, but they can't do it either. So Tim gets another friend, Noah. With his help, let's see what they can do. There are two lessons here. One, the big things that God has for us, we can't do on our own. And two, the contribution of the smallest person is as important as the biggest. You might be thinking, but Tim, I thought you were talking about giving. I am. You see, it's so easy to think, I don't have that much. What difference can I make? In the kingdom of God, the poorest person who gives is just as important as the richest person However much or little you may feel your contribution is, it is significant. Now, when you give here at Ivy Church, you're giving to the mission of helping people find their way back to God. What an incredible thing to be a part of because it makes an eternal difference. So if you give here already, I want to say on behalf of all of us, thank you. And if you don't yet, I want to invite you to start giving back to God here at Ivy Church. And you can do that now by going to ivychurch.org forward slash giving. What would it look like for you to play your part? So, we're going to hear from Louise now. Let's be expectant for what God is going to say to each of us. We love playing the game Jenga in our house. You know, the one with the brick pieces that you first build into a steady tower. We build it up carefully, making sure each piece is straight and in line. And then one by one, we work together to see how long it will remain upright before one of us takes the wrong block and the whole thing comes crashing down. And then we start again and we rebuild the tower and it continues. Now, you might not play Jenga, but I'm sure that you know of other games that are similar or you've built Lego before with kids because it's always all about having the right bricks in the right place for it to work. So why am I talking about Jenga? 
Well, you'll know if you've been following us as a church here at Ivy that we are in our year of rebuilding and in a series looking at the book of Nehemiah. And as we're going to see in today's talk, in order to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem, all the bricks needed to be in place. But for that, Nehemiah needed some willing bricklayers who would need to work in partnership for this to happen. So far in Nehemiah, we've seen that God always keeps his promises. We've seen that through Nehemiah's persistence in prayer and faith in God, he trusted that God wanted Jerusalem's walls rebuilt. Now, Nehemiah knew this wasn't going to be easy. He knew it was going to take effort and it would be hard. And most likely some others around him would say, nope, not interested. Yet he went ahead anyway. But he wasn't alone because he couldn't do it single-handedly because Nehemiah had built a team around him. He had a bunch of people who got the vision, who felt what God felt and were willing to play their part in seeing that vision of the wall being rebuilt. We're gonna read now from chapter three. We're gonna look at verses one to eight. Then Eliashib, the high priest, arose with his brothers, the priests, and built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and hung its doors. Now the sons of Hesaniah built the fish gate they laid its beams and hung its doors with its bolts and bars. And next to them, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the sons of Hakoz, made repairs. And next to him, Meshalim, the son of Bariachiah, the son of Meshabel, made repairs. And Jediah, the son of Pasiah, and Meshalim, the son of Besadiah, repaired the old gate. They laid its beams and hung its doors with its bolts and its bars. And next to him, Hananiah, one of the perfumers, made repairs. And they restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. And there were more gates built, as we read on, repaired by different people, all the way back to the Sheep Gate. Now, chapter three is one of those chapters that you might just skim over because it's one of those that reads as a list of names and can be a bit tricky to read through. Yet for us, it is so important that we know why the names were listed. One, because our names are important to God, and so he makes sure they're recorded. And two, we get to see just who was with Nehemiah and his team, if you like. Why? Because everyone who Nehemiah had got together were people who all felt what God felt. They were going to rebuild God's address. And if you read the list of names, you'll see that these people weren't professional builders. They weren't tradespeople with skills in building. They weren't stonemasons. No expert builders are listed. No, they were ordinary people from different backgrounds with different experience and different skills who had heard from God, who heard his heart and said yes to him. So got stuck in and God used their skills to rebuild his city. There wasn't a professional person on the list, yet they were all united in God's work. And as you carry on reading, we see a whole town who gets stuck in. We see individuals, we see those working in pairs, we see two different regions working together, we see a family building together, we see whole tribes coming together, and every class of person is involved. Servants, guards, goldsmiths, even perfume makers, despite probably never having done such physical and manual work, yet it was all hands on deck. And why is that important for us to know? Well, welcome to church, because that's like church, isn't it? None of us are professional church builders. We are ordinary people who are doing life and we listen to God, we're obedient to him and we feel what he feels. We want to rebuild God's church because it's not our church we're rebuilding, it's his. In the book of Corinthians, when the Apostle Paul is speaking to the church in Corinth, he writes, just as a human body is one, Though it has many parts that together form one body, so too is Christ. For by one spirit we were all immersed and mingled into one single body. And no matter our status, whether we are Jews or non-Jews, oppressed or free, we are all privileged to drink deeply of the same Holy Spirit. Because we are the body of Christ. And you see, when we work together, more can happen. Different skills are used by God. We get to have more fun. We get to worship and praise God together. And we get to learn new things. It's like our friend J. John says, none of us have got it together, but together we've got it. And together they had it. There was a purpose and a focus for Nehemiah's team that was incredible and edifying as they built this wall together. It gave them motivation, it gave them joy. They were working as a team. It was a group of people who got the vision and understood that the rebuilding of the wall was about rebuilding God's city, 
ultimately helping to rededicate people back to God. They gave of themselves because they got it. Something stirred inside of them that was like, I want in on this, I want to play my part. And therefore it didn't become a chore or a burden. It was something that became life-giving. They were on a mission together. And as we read through the chapter, there's one important phrase that's used repeatedly. In fact, it's used 15 to 20 times, and it is, next to him was, and after him was. These guys are working right next to each other and working with one another, just as we read in the book of Romans. Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. Everyone knew their part and why they were doing it. I imagine that when they set out on this mission, they'll have said something like, we're doing this together because we feel what God feels. We're rebuilding his city to help bring people back to God. Just like our mission statement here at Ivy. We want to rebuild God's church on the foundation of Jesus Christ. We want his church to be a place where people find safety, a place where people experience true love for the first time, a place of refuge, a place where people can find freedom again, a place where people can find healing, a place of hope, a place of light into our communities that reflects the love of Jesus. And we've seen this happen in our own church communities through the events we put on over Christmas, for example, and seeing it happen through smaller gatherings, people meeting in their homes and reaching their local community. But we wanna see more. We have such an opportunity as a church to step out into our community, to see communities changed and for people to wonder how we've done it and for them to see then that we've done it because we obeyed God's calling on our lives to build his church, for them to see that we've done it with God's help, but we all have a part to play in this. You see, this team, they had an agreement to all play their part in rebuilding the wall. And that is for us too. Not just leave the rebuilding to the leaders or the staff team or the elders of the church, but for us all to get involved. Because if we're not getting involved and playing our part, then not everything gets done. It's like that game of Jenga. If either the tower isn't built right to begin with, or when you take away a crucial brick, and it becomes unstable and wobbly, and any gaps make it vulnerable. Imagine if in rebuilding the wall, some of the team weren't really all in, and they left some gaps, then the whole structure would have become unstable and compromised. And we don't want this church, God's church, to become compromised. We want to rebuild it to have a solid structure. But to do that, we all need to be playing our part, our own individual parts, praying for our church, praying for our leaders, our young people, serving in some way in different ministry areas, on host teams, kids and youth, prayer ministry, serving our older generations, Worship, tech, planting micro churches to see our own communities changed as we are in relationship with others. The Bible tells us in the book of 1 Peter that Jesus is the living stone and that we as believers who know Jesus and who build our lives on his foundation are living stones. All Jesus asks of us is that we give of ourselves, that we're willing to be involved and help to build his church without any gaps. Maybe you're unsure of your gifting and what God is calling you to do with your life. Maybe you don't think you have anything to offer. And if that is you, then remember Hananiah. You see, he was a perfumer by trade, and yet he was still willing to get in there. He was still willing to get his hands dirty and and help do his part by repairing part of the wall. And if a perfumer can build a wall, then you can help build this church. Or you might be listening to this thinking, well, I, I hear you, Louise, but I'm too busy to help and serve right now. Well, then I'd say you're a normal person doing life like the rest of us. And I'd also say that when you play your part, you'll definitely be blessed. Or maybe your new normal is filling your Sundays with other things because habits and rhythms have changed during 2021. So Sunday morning gatherings don't fit. Well, please make sure you stay connected. But one way might be to invite others around later on on a Sunday or during the week to listen to the talk and pray together. Or maybe you can commit to either joining a grow group if you're not in one, or if you are, being at your grow group each week. Because Nehemiah didn't rebuild the walls of Jerusalem alone. He did it with his team. I read a quote that said, to accomplish God's purpose, we need a common vision, dedicated leaders and willing workers to do their part. 
We want God's church to rise, don't we? We want to see his kingdom advance on this earth. And in playing our own individual parts, then we together will build an incredible testimony to Jesus. So I want to give us an opportunity to respond to this. How are you gonna help rebuild God's house? What's stopping you from being involved? Don't let comparison get in the way. Don't let that rob you of the joy you can have from serving. What part are you gonna play? There's someone I've been chatting to recently at church who said she saw a gap in a rotor and so she stepped in and she filled it. What gaps can you see? What gaps need filling? Because we are all responsible for building God's church. We might not know what that's going to look like, but that's okay because he absolutely does. And all he asks is that we come with openness, with willing hearts, with an attitude of being all in and in us fully trusting that he knows what's to come. And that is exciting. We read, don't we? See, I am doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? And we get to be part of that. So where can you serve? Where can you help build this church brick by brick? There are so many opportunities. So I want you to take the time now to grab a pen and a piece of card or paper and ask him where it is he wants you to play your part and to write that down. Ask him to stir inside of you a place he's calling you into. How are you going to play your part in rebuilding his house? And let us know what he's putting on your heart, where it is you're going to play your part. Then make sure you go and speak to someone about that. Tell us where that's going to be. If you're watching online, then email us at info at ivychurch.org. Or if you're in the room, give that card to one of the hosts or team here in the room, because we want to hear from you. Let me just pray for us. Thank you, God, that you are the all-knowing, the all-seeing God. Thank you that you know how you want to use us to rebuild your kingdom here on earth. Thank you that you have given each and every one of us gifts that we get to use to serve you and your house. I pray now, Father, that you'll be stirring our hearts, that you'll be speaking into each one of us and showing us what that looks like and that we will be obedient to you and your call. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Louise. We're going to have some time to reflect on some questions now. If you are on your own, you can share your answers in the chat or the comments, or you can make notes as you think about what we've heard today. If you're with others, you can use them as a discussion guide, and uh, you'll have five minutes or so on the timer. And if this isn't enough, then you can always press pause and then continue when you're ready. So. Once we've taken an opportunity to look at these questions, then we'll come together for our final worship song.
Romans 11:29 For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. 40 something years ago I decided that I wanted to take that step in accepting Jesus Christ as my personal savior and live a life committed of service to him. At that time I was a teenager in high school oblivious to the fact that being a grown-up wasn't all it was promoted to be as seen on TV. 
Since then, my journey has taken many twists and turns, experienced some highs, lows, and even some very low lows. Even then, and to present day, I knew that God had called me not just to knowingly be his child, but to be a child who really knew him, and in knowing him, had a loving duty to serve others in whatever sphere of influence I found myself, which I eventually realized they were orchestrated by him. Mostly in the most unexpected, random, insignificant, to me anyway, my new non-earth-shattering ways possible, just by turning up and having conversations. Any conversations with connected two or more people at any given time in any given place. It was initially that prevailing sense of saying no that I promised to think about with a view of considering serving as an elder at Ivy Church. Somewhere that I've already invested almost 20 years in various capacities, starting out as a Sunday school teacher for the year 7 to 12 age groups way, way, way back in the day. Those children are now adults, some with children of their own. But they remain as precious to me now as they were then. Key message here is, nothing stands still, and God wants to use us in this moment, this period of our life's journey. More recently, I had the privilege of serving on the staff team, a project that was for seven months, which became two years, and I'm a better person as a result. You see, that gave me an invaluable front seat into the heart of what happens behind the scenes, the leadership and the leaders who have been appointed to serve. They some, the sometimes whimsical yet complexity of creatively planning services and or other church events as a group of believers to benefit and grow the church of which we are a part of. Not many people get to see that side. The challenging work, the dedication and the commitment that goes into it. We turn up on a Sunday and things just happen and flow. We don't, or most of us, ever think of the many and intricate pieces that go into us doing things with excellence. Mostly, without any acknowledgement or appreciation, regularly outside of the formal contracted hours. I've been in church for a long time, and I can assure you, we are the hardest to lead. So my challenge to you, as you consider me to serve you, is to remember that we are all called to serve in different capacities, and those who choose to work on the team really need to be applauded, supported, and appreciated. That time for me was when my fate and work collided in a wonderful and unforgettable way. I have agreed to come on, on board to serve in a different capacity, that of an elder, which I'm also really fit the part as I'm now truly a grown-up person. What do I bring? I'm a relational person and have many people-related skills, some naturally through DNA and others cultivated and nurtured throughout my lifetime. I also love to share perspective and some life lessons that I've learned over many decades. I stand here as a result of the many investment others have made in me inside and outside the church. Currently, I serve on a team at Press Red, a charity founded by a member of this body, looking at gender-based violence against women and girls. This role has really opened my eyes to things right in front of me that I had no idea of. Part of my role is to engage church leaders in raising awareness and educating them so they know these critical issues could exist within their congregations and how to produ and productively we aim to equip them with the knowledge, skills and tools to act decisively when these issues arise. I'm also an advanced grief recovery specialist, supporting people who have suffered loss and grief of any kind, and a community mediator, and relationship and executive coach, to name a few things I get up to, as and when needed. On a personal level, I'm married to Carl, who serves on the tech team. We have two adult children and, almost, and an almost adult nephew who lives with us, and two grandsons. So definitely connected to real life and life events in various forms. So that's a snapshot of my life's journey to date. I'm committing to adding a new chapter in service to you and the wider church. 
family and look forward to what value I can add to the already stalwart team and likewise how I can be further grown and stretched throughout my tenure. Lastly, if we ever meet and our paths cross, please do say hello. I would love to meet you. I am Michelle. While people have different pressures and problems and priorities with money, finances can often be a struggle for just about every one of us. It seems however much we have, very often it doesn't feel like we have quite enough. Famously, even Rockefeller, who at the time was the most um, rich man in the world, was asked, how much would it take to make you happy? And he said, just a little bit more. And that's how we can sometimes feel. Most of our money problems, however, not, don't really so much come from ha not having enough, but the way that we think or the way actually that money makes us feel and our attitude towards money and uh, our beliefs about what it can do and what it can't do for us. That's why, however much we may have or how little we may have, we can have this financial stress. And God doesn't want to live in that place. He says he doesn't want us to worry about money. Jesus said actually he described it as being a very little thing, although we can make it a very big thing. And we live in a world of so much financial uncertainty. So that's why we introduced this concept here at Ivy of the generosity ladder. You know what a ladder does. It gets you from one level to another. It gets you from one place to another. Things that seemed once out of reach are now within my reach once we get to the top of that. And that's where God wants to take us. Wherever we're at now, he wants to lift us up and to be able to take us into a new place with regard to uh, all kinds of things, but particularly we're talking today about finances. And the way that God does that is he doesn't put me in a lift. Very often I could just want to get in a lift and press the button and be somewhere else. But God doesn't give me a lift. He takes me up different steps. On top of the ladder, and to be honest with you, there's no kind of top to this ladder really, but it's that place of financial security and stress-free peace with regard to, to money. I don't have to worry about debt, I don't have to, uh, I've got some savings, and I'm able to give from a generous and happy heart. That I can live the way God wants me to live with regard to money. So week by week, we're going to at times look at different steps along this ladder as a church together and, uh, and to encourage you to think about uh, all of your money that God has given you and to be able to then think about what you're going to do with it. And so today, the first question is this, to ask is this, where are you? I'm at ground level right now. What is your current attitude with regard to money and finances? Do you feel that you're in control or does money control you? Check the balance so that then you can move on to the next step of where God wants you to be with regard to money. And just think about this one Bible verse with me, if you can. Um, yeah, this can help to get a different perspective on my money. James chapter 1, verse 17 declares, Whatever is a good gift comes down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. Everything comes from him we have opportunity to give some back. Amazing, it's been great to be with you today. Before we finish, there are two things I want to remind you about. The first is that tonight we have our first Ivy Central of the year. Join us in person at Ivy Church in Didsbury at seven o'clock. And also in three weeks, on the 13th of February, we're going to be having our first fruits offering, an opportunity for us to give back first and best over and above at the start of the year. So I want to encourage you to take some time in the coming week to ask God, what would it look like for you to give at first fruits? It's been great to be with you today. God bless you and have a great week.